Happy holidays, everyone! This is our first Ask the Expert episode of our BioBlitz Oklahoma podcast. I am Priscilla Crawford, conservation biologist at the Oklahoma Biological Survey. Angelina San Campiano and I chat with botanist Adam Ryburn about holiday traditions around some of our native and non-native plants. We talk about the biology, ecology, and cultural history of a wide variety of flowering and cone-bearing plants. Hi, Angelina. Are you a true southerner and shiver when the temperatures get below 50, or do you enjoy winter? No, I totally love the winter. I'm happy to wear as many layers as possible. Yeah, I totally enjoy this season of early nights and cozy blankets, but I really do like kind of the length of Oklahoma winters. I lived in Vermont for four years, and I don't think I could handle snow for four or five months anymore. True. Here we get snow for a couple days, and then it's mild and sunny afterwards. Yeah, all of it's great in small doses, and our Oklahoma weather is changing all the time. So when you get tired of one temperature, changes again. (laughs) <laughs> That's totally true. Yeah, one day it could be freezing and the next day it could be 75. I think today is supposed to be 75. With the short days, it really is hard to make sure that you get outside during that small window of daylight. Yes, we've been waking up earlier to squeeze in every bit of daylight. And since it is so dark, I do like the holiday season with like twinkly lights. Oh, oh and of course, cookies and things like that. Uh, Yes, for me, it's eggnog and mulled wine, um, hot chocolate, Christmas stouts. (laughs) Yeah, all the food is definitely a plus. And also because I'm a botanist at heart, I love all the decorations associated with plants. Evergreen trees, the holly and the ivy, mistletoes, and many of these plant-based traditions began with the Celts way before Christmas when they celebrated the winter solstice. So maybe that's part of my Irish ancestry coming out too. It's always so funny to me to think about Christmas time in the Southern Hemisphere. I remember when I was a kid and for the first time I saw a picture of Santa surfing in Australia. Oh yeah. And I was like, That's so true. It's not winter for them. So part of the holiday magic that I think of is flora, fauna, the weather surrounding it, and nature is so intrinsically linked to the holiday, but it's not the same weather ever. (laughs) Right. And also taking time during the holidays to be outside. That's always been an important tradition for my family is to be outside during the holidays and enjoy that cold weather in our short doses, but also enjoy the plants and animals that you see around this time of year. Leading us into the plants and animals this time of year, we have received some questions about some winter holiday plants in the past couple weeks. Some people have been posting things about mistletoe. I think this would be the perfect time for our first Ask the Expert podcast episode. Okay, I have lined up just the person to ask. Not only is he our quote-unquote esteemed botanist, a name I accidentally bestowed on him in a local rural newspaper and we have run with since, but he's my former professor, and I know for a fact that he shares my passion for all things holiday drinks because he recently dropped off some pumpkin spice cider on my door. (laughs) I am notoriously bad at botany. But I know that you, Priscilla, and Adam are very knowledgeable. So I have a lot of questions for both of you. Dr. Adam Ryburn, you've graciously agreed to answer my many botanical questions for the last 10 years and again today on our podcast. So welcome, Dr. Ryburn. Well, hello, y'all. How's it going? Great. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you. Oh, we should also note that Adam is a professor at Oklahoma City University. Hello, Angelina, my favorite student of all time. (laughs) (laughs) I will remember to put your annual payoff in the mail for that comment. Thank you. Um, And Angelina's birthday is coming up pretty soon as well. Um, So I'll have to send her another case of pumpkin spice cider before long. Is that made from the, the cider place in Oklahoma City, the new place? Actually, this one that I got is from Black Apple, which is in Fanville, Arkansas. Oh, okay. Because there is a new hard cider place in Oklahoma City. 
Yeah, OK Cider Company. Yeah, we frequent that place. For research, right? For research purposes only, yeah. yeah they've got some pretty good um, kind of Christmassy ciders, too, with some vanilla and cinnamon and cranberry, and there's some different ones. So it's important for botanists to talk about plant-based drinks. <laughs> well, I guess we should probably start asking Adam some questions about plants, though. So last week, I was preparing for an event at the park. We were making wreaths out of eastern red cedars and shortleaf pines, and it really got me thinking about these yuletide botanicals. So a big part of it is decorations. You know, you think of your Christmas tree, you think of the mistletoe and the boughs of holly, but a big part of it is Christmas songs. Not only are we envisioning it, but we're thinking of that specific vernacular that we associate with Christmas. And a lot of it, I always thought was antiquated terms like boughs of holly. But then I started thinking like, actually maybe that has something to do with botany. And I was like, this sounds like a question that I need Dr. Ryburn to answer for me. And the first thing that I think everyone would picture for Christmas is a Christmas tree. So these evergreen trees, which obviously they stay green year round, but do they ever lose their leaves? Absolutely. All trees replenish their leaves frequently. Of course, we see that deciduous trees, the ones that lose their leaves every autumn, of course, do this on a much more obvious basis. Evergreens do lose their leaves as well. So if you've ever you know, had a pine tree in your yard or been around pine trees or visited Sequoia State Park and drove along the, um, the main road, you'll see that there is a carpet of these orange pine needles underneath the shortleaf pine that are there. And that's all due to the fact that these evergreens do lose needles, but they continuously repl replenish them as well. So they have leaves on at all time, the leaves stay green, and even in the wintertime, you get these kind of signs of life amongst all the dreary and drab days of winter. Is there a seasonality to when they lose a lot of leaves? Mostly in winter, especially because all plants basically in, in temperate climates, because we're talking about temperate species here, basically go dormant in the winter. Even though pine trees and other evergreens, even some flowering evergreens, will go dormant in the winter, because if you don't go dormant and you continue to transport water to tissues such as leaves, that's going to freeze and it's going to damage those tissues. You're going to find that um, primarily in the fall, even up to winter, you're going to find many more of these evergreens losing their needles still retaining many of them. Um, and then in the spring, when it starts to warm up again, water starts to be flowing through the, those tissues. Those needles come back, just like the leaves from the deciduous trees start to come back. You hinted at something in there about evergreens that are flowering versus evergreens that make cones. That's an interesting point to bring up because a lot of people use the term conifer and evergreen, and sometimes they use them interchangeably, which isn't botanically technically correct. So maybe we could talk a little bit about kind of the differences between what, what's a conifer and what's an evergreen. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, a conifer is any cone-bearing plant. These are gymnosperms. And what that suggests is that the seeds of those plants are kind of born exposed to the environment, exposed to the atmosphere. They're not enclosed within a fruit like what would happen with an, a flowering plant, what we call an angiosperm. And it's the case where not all conifers are evergreens and not, ever, not all evergreens are conifers. Because there are some conifers which are not evergreens. They actually are deciduous as well. Case in point would be our bald cypress. If anyone has any bald cypress in their yards or that you've been in Bricktown in Oklahoma City or you've been down in southeastern Oklahoma around Beaver's Bend, you'll notice that those large trees that we consider to be conifers, of course, lose their, their needles, their leaves every year. Um, but then there's also the angiosperms or the, the flowering plants that um, will contain evergreen leaves. But the green, those leaves are different in the fact that they're broad leaf. They're not the needle-like structures that we see with the conifers that are evergreens. And so how they adapt, instead of having a reduced surface area like the, the needles will have, they typically will have a very waxy covering. And they'll also produce some anti-freeze proteins, which will keep the waters that 
are the water that is in those tissues from freezing up and bursting those tissues, uh, basically from forming ice. Yeah, so some of our evergreen, non-coniferous plants are hollies, and that's a really good example. I think a lot of people have have felt a holly leaf and how thick it is and how it has that really protective outer coating from losing water during the winter. And just to throw in some Oklahoma diversity stuff, our conifers, like you mentioned, we have the bald cypress, which is down in the very southeastern part of the state, although it is used ornamentally throughout the state, like you mentioned. Naturally, it occurs in the southeastern part of the state. And then um, we have some pine trees that are conifers and our junipers or um, what we refer to as cedars too here in the state. So those are our conifers that we have within Oklahoma. Hollies are interesting because not only are they evergreen, but we do have a species that's deciduous. So let we could confuse everybody here. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. With it, and that's a, the case with a lot of plant species or plant genera, even with plant families, is that you always get the exception um, of things which are a little different, like the deciduous holly or the deciduous conifers in way of the bald cypress. So there's always um, some sort of exception to the, the botanical rule. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've said it before in the podcast that there are always exceptions to any biological rule that you can come up with. And it really frustrates my students a lot of times <laughs> or in, in lay folks who will be on field trips like, why can't they play by the rules? Why can't it just be black or white? That's not the way nature is. No, no. But it does make learning hard because you don't have those hard and fast rules. Well, I thought I was totally going to stump you with that question about hollies because I remember being so amazed that pine needles, that needles are leaves and that they're modified and that they have that decreased surface area and all of that. But what about holly? Because it stays green year round and it has those broad spiky leaves. So explain that to me, Ryburn, but you did. Well, and I could go on, and and so I will. Um, (laughs) If you think about the hollies as well during um, this time of the year, as well as a lot of other flowering evergreens, um, not only are their leaves green during this time, but they're also typically producing or they're bearing their fruits. Um, Hollies are a good example of this, in which they're bearing their brightly colored red fruits Um, At the same time as their leaves being out and nothing else is competing for attracting those frugivores, those birds mainly that um, like to eat fruits but will deposit the seeds somewhere else. And so it's, of course, an attraction mechanism and provides a way of dispersal of the next generation of plant. That, of course, has led to... Humans, of course, seeing these things just like the animals are seeing these things and seeing this as a sign of life amongst all the the grayness and fertility amongst all the grayness. And of course, we've adapted that to a lot of our traditions, mainly Christmas traditions. Which were co-opted traditions from winter solstice and, and New Year's. Those traditions were held by people before Christmas even happened. And then to try to encourage people to take on the new Christian traditions, they incorporated some of these winter solstice things. So it, it seemed a little more familiar when they converted to Christianity. Exactly. We see that with, of course, holly. We see it with mistletoe. We, we see it with um, the Christmas tree itself. The Christmas tree itself, the, the winter tree, was a time in which, of course, uh, I think it maybe started in Scandinavia, northern temperate um, Europe, in which they would um, celebrate the winter solstice, December 21st, as bringing in um, this green thing, which is nice and fertile and had a lot of life, uh, represented a promise to... That spring would finally come. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The spring is coming. There's there's life. There's fertility yet to come. The days aren't going to be this short forever. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> of course, they brought these trees. They would have this a big event in which they would bring these trees inside in their dwellings, their homes. When Christianity evolved and recognized you know, December 25th as a day of celebration. Then Christmas trees took on a a different meaning um, in which they would decorate those trees with things like um, apples and candles. Of course, I think the apple hanging from a Christmas tree in early times was probably a representation of 
the tree of paradise or the tree that was in the Garden of Eden that was supposedly an apple tree. But there's no evidence of that, of course, and there's no biblical evidence of that either. I had heard that it might be a pomegranate tree. Yeah. If we're looking at sort of the, I don't know, the Fertile Crescent or the area of the Middle East where it's believed the Garden of Eden would have been. Or where the story would have originated. Um, apples likely wouldn't have grown there. But pomegranates would have. It's interesting to, to think about in the red balls we hang from Christmas trees um, today are reminiscent of the red apples that once hung from trees. You mentioned how plants now that are bearing fruits are become symbols during this dark period during winter. One of the other plants that you mentioned uh, also bears fruits this time of year, which is the mistletoe. And so the mistletoe is super weird in in so many ways. <laughs> and the fact that we use it as part of our seasonal celebration is interesting. And again, because it stays green all winter long, it can flower in the, in the winter as well as produce fruits. Exactly. So I was thinking how it's weird that we bring in trees to our house. I've never really thought about that before. If you think about it as a tree versus a Christmas tree, like cutting it down, bringing it inside, has sap, it releases its needles, it's kind of a pain. But then when you think about bringing mistletoe into your house, it's really weird because mistletoe is a parasite or a hemiparasite, and that can freak people out. So you're cutting down a hemi parasite and bringing it into your house. People aren't into that. <laughs> but they are. They just they just don't know it. <laughs> the term parasite or hemi parasite, maybe some folks need to know the distinction there. And a hemi parasite is a plant which derives some of its nutrients from a host plant. But it's also photosynthetic. So that's why, of course, mistletoe is green and it's green year round. And like you mentioned, Priscilla, it produces fruits and flowers during the winter. And it's one of those things which it's really amongst a lot of areas, especially something like Oklahoma. It's one of the few things which is green and growing in trees which have lost all of their leaves. One of those signs of there's still life during these cold, these cold, dark days. Um, it's got a long history of being used for different medicinal purposes, especially in Europe. In the New World, um, we've got a, a different genus altogether than what we find in, in Europe. It's not been used medicinally as much, but it does have its own interesting story, especially with, related to Oklahoma. Yeah, so it's our floral emblem, right? Right. How it became our floral emblem is uh, an interesting story. I um, recall I was in grad school and my mentor, um, my graduate advisor, and of course, um, Oklahoma Botanical Legacy himself, Ron Turrell, told a story to our class one time about mistletoe and says, you know, in the territorial times, you know, before we became a state, still, of course, settlers here after the, the land run, especially, and you get these really harsh winters, which may kill off some settlers, kill off some folks. And the only thing that was around to adorn their gravesides was uh, mistletoe. It was the only thing that was green. Even though it sounds a little morbid, it became um, this symbol of life even when there is death. And actually, I think it was in the late 1800s, maybe 1890s or so, there was this push across the United States to have states and then territories in our situation um, recognize their state floral emblem, something that recognizes their state. And so Oklahoma issued up the mistletoe as their state floral emblem. It's actually our first emblem of the state, the first thing that recognizes their state. You know, we know of like the state bird, which is this is flycatcher, the state mammal, which is the bison, and the state reptile, the collared lizard, and all those things a lot of us um, knew in grade school, but the state floral emblem, the mistletoe, was actually the very first designated to re represent our state. I didn't realize that that was our first state symbol. I had heard the story about the grave decorations. It was within the first year or so of statehood that they designated that. It was very important to some of those 89ers or those people who did the land run to recognize this land. Yeah, it had a little competition, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Even then? Yes. Um, uh, we probably all know of um, one of our early governors in the state, Alfalfa Bill Murray. Oh, yeah. The reason he had his nickname, Alfalfa Bill Murray, he was really big on alfalfa. He loved alfalfa, and he wanted alfalfa to be the state floral emblem, and that Oklahoma would be recognized as the alfalfa state. 
But we still grow a lot of it, that's for sure. We do. But the alfalfa flower, which is pretty small, it's, it's a nice looking flower if you get close up to it. It's not uh, something that necessarily going to blow you away. <laughs> no offense to alfalfa farmers. But. <laughs> well, one of the things Angelina said about how weird it was that we brought in mistletoe, which is a parasite. I did a little research for a talk that I'm doing about the cultural significance of mistletoe. One of the things I came across was that the Celts, who their kind of intellectual class was the Druids. Some people um, think of them as being the kind of the spiritual leaders, but they were also like the educated class and they were kind of the doctors in the society, but they held the mistletoe as one of the most sacred plants. And one of the reasons why is because it was rooted closer to the heavens than any other plant. It was rooted high up in a tree and certain mistletoes were considered more important or more sacred depending on what tree they were in. White oaks were very important in Europe for mistletoe. And while we're talking about mistletoe, you mentioned that it's used for medicinal purposes. Correct. And usually medicinal plants are toxic because of all the compounds. So if you if you take too much of it, it becomes toxic. And we are in no way suggesting anybody use mistletoe as a medicine in this podcast. Unless it's a love potion. <laughs> no, no, love no, no. We're not we're not <laughs> suggesting it for anything. <laughs> We do not recommend mistletoe as a medicinal product. It was toxic, and the toxicity is related to its host plant. Oh, that's something I did not know. White oaks were um, prized for the mistletoe in them because of the particular qualities it had. I'm not sure. I don't know the compounds, but they are doing studies on mistletoe toxicity and the compounds in them, and it's And it's actually being used in some modern medicine now. That's kind of cool. So I had a question about how they grow so high up in trees, like you were talking about, because they're not rooted. They're not like a vine that's climbing up the tree. And so I was looking into it a couple years ago. How are their seeds spread? They're not spread by wind. They're not like lightweight. They're these berries. And as is typical in biology, we get to talk about poop. Oh, yes. Yes. Bird poop. (laughs) Yeah, so we mentioned that a lot of the things that are flowering and fruiting right now attract the dispersers that will want to eat those fruits. And so that's how, of course, mistletoe is is dispersed. That's how eastern red cedar that we find in the state is dispersed. And primarily it's the cones and, of course, the seeds inside of the eastern red cedar are dispersed primarily in the winter because it allows um, that cold allows the the fruit to split open. And it's a really cool story about that. I'll go ahead and get into it. What's really cool is that there's a small amount of water that's going to be contained within those tiny little blue, what we think of as cedar berries, but they're actually cones. Um, And then water freezes, it splits, and that allows some natural yeast and bacteria to get inside. It actually ferments those, those small little cones, and it makes that attractive to birds, which typically would not eat them. It actually is some semi-intoxication of these birds, which eat these things. And of course, it disperses the seeds as a result. So the fermentation has to happen before the birds are attracted to it? Yes. I didn't know that. Wow, that's cool. It all comes full circle Back to fermentation. <laughs> right. Alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> Alcohol in the winter. That's it's every every form of life needs it, right? <laughs> there is um there is kind of an extra interesting story about birds eating mistletoe fruits and and then pooping out the seeds because of the seeds being so sticky. Hmm. And that's one way that the seeds get deposited on the twigs is because the birds sometimes have to scrape off the sticky seed as it's being, I should try to figure out the correct <laughs> <laughs> deposited. D- deposited. Uh, uh, what's that? You're the, you're the, you're the mammal person. Defecated. <laughs> defecated there we go defecated and so they have to because they kind of stick they have to scrape them off onto the twigs and that puts the seed in the correct location whereas if a bird just pooped on top of a tree it would just drop to the ground but they have to do that kind of scraping motion so that the seed will stick to the twig so is it a twig or is it a branch or is it a bow? because I had to look this one up. So it's B-O-U-G-H. I won't lie to you. 
I looked up bowel <laughs> and bow and all kinds of different words before I found it's B-O-U-G-H, boughs of holly. And so what does that mean? Is it a botanical term? It's not a term that's used typically by botanists. Um, if it is, it's in a general sense, um, but it's not a scientific term. A bow is basically a branch, a branch of a, a woody plant. And so when you talk about boughs of holly and you want to deck the halls with boughs of holly, you're basically hanging holly branches on your walls. And it's like if you think of the old nursery rhyme, you know, when the bough breaks, the cradle will fall. Again, that's the bough or the, the branch breaks and something falls. Why would somebody put a cradle up? I don't have any idea. Seems weird. I don't <laughs> understand that one. Okay, so another song I started thinking of was partridge and a pear tree. And so we were talking about how like pomegranates are a wintertime fruit. I don't think of, of apples as being a wintertime fruit. We we're talking about more of the cultural significance. Are pears a wintertime fruit? Why do we have pear trees in one of our traditional Christmas songs? There's a couple of questions there to, to answer. It is true that apples and, and, of course, their relatives, pears, typically aren't wintertime fruits, but they are late fall fruiting, mid to late fall. In northern temperate climates, it's possible you could find apple trees or and pear trees, which are related to apples. They're in the same um, subfamily of the, of the rose family. Are they poems? They, yeah, they produce a fruit called a poem. I remember something from botany. Oh, there you go. But pears and apples, they're associated with the winter months because they store well, really well. So they're harvested in the fall or late summer, and then they you can store them and eat them throughout the winter. So those would be things that people would have available during the winter months while they're celebrating these holidays. So I think that's why pears and apples are associated with winter holidays pretty regularly. There's possible a chance where you could have a pear tree that still has pears on the tree during the winter. Uh, of course, a partridge is a bird. It's in the same family, actually, as quail and pheasants. And partridges, all three of those groups are going to be round and grousing, um, grazing, <laughs> I should say, during the winter. So it's possible you could find during the winter a partridge that's actually in a pear tree. But how that has anything to do with the 12 days of Christmas is a mystery to me. So the 12 days of Christmas, this always gets me because people think of the 12 days of Christmas as the 12 days leading up to Christmas, which is technically not correct. It's the 12 days after the 25th of December are the 12 days of Christmas, which ending in the day of Epiphany, the day of Epiphany. I'm going a little more religious than I expected. But the day of Epiphany is the day that the three wise men or the three kings arrived with their gifts at the manger or the stable or wherever the baby was. So it took them 12 days after they saw the star in the sky to reach. So that was at the day of Epiphany. So that's the 12 days of Christmas following Christmas Day. The reason why I bring this up is because the wise men brought the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which is also related to botany. So we all know what gold is, but frankincense and myrrh, a lot of people might not realize what frankincense and myrrh are, a resin product from trees that grew in the Middle East. Oh, the whole Arabian Peninsula and that kind of Northeastern Africa. These are resin products that were really important for the people at the time. And they were probably even more expensive than gold at the time. So do they smell good? What's their purpose? Yes. They smell good. They yield essential oils. They were actually edible, so people could chew them as gum, but then they're extremely fragrant. They're used as incense. I think they were used for some medicinal purposes at the time, too. These were really important things at the time and very expensive. I think that's the significance of the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So they were bringing some of their most valuable possessions to who they thought was going to be the savior. I would have to Google how to spell frankincense and myrrh too. That's okay. I think I misspelled in my notes. But anyway, so that's botanically related, although we don't have any of those species in Oklahoma that would produce the resins for frankincense and myrrh. Another plant which we find typically around this time that's brought inside, or at least it's, it's um, sold a lot, 
That's poinsettia. Oh, yeah. Are they native? Poinsettias are not native. They're a tropical species, actually native to southern Mexico and Central America. And so it's one of our few Christmassy type of plants, which is a new world species. Thus, it's a fairly new phenomenon that we find as a Christmas tradition than what we had from the old world traditions that were brought back over to the new world or brought to the new world. Poinsettia is interesting because, because like you mentioned, the what we think of as the pretty part is not the flower. Um, a lot of people refer to those red bracts as the flower, but really it's just a teeny little thing in the middle that is the technical flower. Right. First, the poinsettia is part of the Spurge family, the Euphorbiaceae, in which many of the flowers that are part of that family are inconspicuous. Typically, um, the bracts or so are are going to be brightly colored or large and, and showy in order to help attract pollinators or to sometimes deter herbivores from chewing on them. Oh, yeah. And poinsettia, of course, another one of those plants that is generally toxic to yes. mammals. <laughs> so so maybe the red is signifying that day away, don't eat me. Don't eat me. Yes, exactly. My daughter just came from home from school. But there's one thing she was talking about last night because we were talking about the mistletoe. And she says, is it mistletoe a parasite? I said, yeah. She goes, so human parasites decided to choose a parasite for their floral emblem. That's deep mean, of course, because the settlers who were settling on this land that was not theirs decided to choose a parasite. Yeah, so much symbolism. Well, and then, of course, like almost all of these plant-based traditions that we're talking about that are now associated with Christianity and Christmas had some previous importance to groups of people that were not Christian. The Christians co-opted them to convince them that that it was still part of their culture. Those pagans. Yep, those druids. Maybe somewhere back in my history, I have a I have some druid ancestors. Well, thanks, Adam, for joining us on the podcast. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us during the holidays and during your winter break. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryburn, the esteemed botanist of Oklahoma, and another one of my favorite botanists, Priscilla. I learned so much from you two in the last 10 years and today. So thanks for sharing your botanical knowledge. For some of you who are interested in a little bit more information about our native woody plants, um, I highly recommend you get the Forest Trees of Oklahoma book, which is a bargain at only $8. You can order directly from Oklahoma Forestry Services, and I'll put a link for that in the, the show notes. Um, And one more warning for folks, if you're out walking around in the woods because of, especially in central Oklahoma, because of recent ice storms, beware of all those boughs breaking. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. And thanks everyone who listened to our first Ask the Expert podcast. We have new episodes lined up for the new year, and we would love to explore your questions on future Ask the Expert episodes. You can send your questions to us as a Facebook message, as a tweet, or simply as an email. Links are in the show notes. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen so you are notified when we upload our new episodes. This podcast is a project of BioBlitz Oklahoma, an outreach program of the Oklahoma Biological Survey at the University of Oklahoma. Happy holidays, and we hope you celebrate with time outside exploring Oklahoma's amazing biodiversity. Remember, you can find biodiversity right outside your own door.